Hey, yeah. So I'm here to talk about Sherlock, mixing for cryptocurrencies from multi-party DSA. This is a joint work with uh, an excellent crypto cryptographer, my friend Omer Shlomovitz, who is a co-founder of KZEN. Um, so in the beginning of my talk, I will give a motivation why we need privacy overlays for existing cryptocurrencies. Um, I will extensively overview the state of the art, like previous proposals. Um, and then I introduce our proposal, Sherlock, and I will convince you why our proposal is better than the previous proposals. And then I, uh, by comparing it with, uh, with, the, with the state of the art, and then I conclude my talk. So if we think of this whole industry as a whole, uh, on an average day in 2019 Q3, there were one million transactions settled. Uh, so on all the cryptocurrencies existing today, on an average day, one million transactions were settled, like more than half of the transactions were settled on ETH, Ethereum, uh, one quarter of the transactions um, were settled on Bitcoin. Uh, and my point is that on, on this pie chart, you don't even see any privacy coins. So you cannot even see the half percent of Monero and the 0.23% of Zcash. So we, so essentially in this whole industry, all the transactions occurring are, do not provide any financial privacy for their users. So we would crucially need privacy overlays. Um, yeah. Uh, what are the practical consequences of the lack of privacy? Uh, how many of you have ever purchased any kind of service or product by paying with cryptocurrencies? Please uh, raise, raise your hand. Okay, nice. So the vast majority. Um, so what are the practical consequences? Let's say you're purchasing your morning latte with a cryptocurrency, Ether, Bitcoin, a non-privacy coin. Uh, the barista would know your address, and then he, can sh he, he or she can just type your address in a blockchain explorer and see your balance and all your previous transaction history. By the way, this is the address of uh, Vitalik, and you will see in a second why I know the address of Vitalik. Um, so with a single transaction, you can expose your entire uh, financial history, right? Um, and in this sense, cryptocurrency is way worse than cash because if you go to a coffee place and pay with cash, um, you retain your financial privacy. And um, if we don't want to end up in an Orwellian dystopia, we, we need financial privacy. And, but sadly, the current situation is even worse than this Orwellian dystopia because in our current threat model, even a barista, even any kind of merchant could track you. So a single shot, a single transaction, and your financial privacy is lost forever, and then the merchant can track you uh, until you die. Right. Uh, and Jan Myers usually like to say, like, uh, cryptocurrencies is Twitter your, for your bank account, and there are many people like um, just publishing their address on Twitter or Reddit or other public forums and like, right, just don't do this. This is uh, financial privacy lesson 101. Never, so this is where I know the address of Vitalik, but he's not the only example who just willingly gave away financial privacy. Um, and yeah, just don't do this. And in my talk, I will focus on mostly account-based cryptocurrencies because mostly for UTXO-based currencies, the, the problem is kind of solved. So um, with Bitcoin, privacy preserving, privacy enhancing is, is kind of a solved problem. Like you have um, wallets which provide you enhancing solutions, already built-in mixing solutions. So in my talk, I'll, I will focus on uh, exclusively account-based cryptocurrencies because in account-based cryptocurrencies, most of the people just use one or two accounts. Um, so people just reuse the addresses. Uh, and in the Bitcoin um, community, usually account address reuse is avoided already on the software level. So uh, it's super nice. Um, just, a, j just a quick recap, what is a cryptocurrency mixer? A cryptocurrency mixer, we have a party, can be a trusted party or a distributed protocol or implemented in a smart contract. And we have several senders, like we have K senders on the right hand side and they can send, they can deposit equal amount of coins to this mixer and then intended recipients can withdraw the, their coins. So going back to our initial example, um, 
In our case, the barista would not know when she withdraws the coin from the mixer, whether it came from the lady with the glasses or the, or the gentleman. So we have an enhanced notion of privacy, and this is called k-anonymity. So essentially those senders are among this anonymity, anonymity set, they are indistinguishable. And obviously, in, so we, here we have k send, uh, recipients. Um, in the early days of Bitcoin, for example, uh, these mixer parties were implemented a, as uh, for-profit companies. And the problem with that is that there's a, involved a trust because this trusted party just could go offline or they could just hold back coins and steal coins. Oh. Right, so what I'm going to focus on is mixing protocols where the mixing party is implemented as a third party, but with public state. So essentially it's a smart contract. Um, right, and what are the security goals, first of all, um, before reviewing the literature, what are the security goals we would like to have from such a privacy enhancing tool? Uh, first, we would like to ensure that the funds are always available. So whenever senders deposit their coins into this box, into this mixer, eventually they should be able to retrieve these coins, but only once. So no one should be able to, coin, uh, able to steal coins uh, from other participants. And more crucially, we would like to achieve k-anonymity, which essentially entails that the mapping between senders and recipients remain private even for the participants themselves. So not only for the whole blockchain, for the whole world, but even for the participants themselves, because if, if there would be a single party who knows the mapping between senders and recipients, then the single party could just disclose the mapping and then there would be essentially no privacy enhancement. Um, the first work, academic work, which was done in this area is, uh, is called Mobius. It's a work by Sarah Miklajon and Rebecca Mercer by the time in uh, uh, University College London. And they, pro uh, they defined these security uh, properties in a game-based framework and proved their uh, protocol secure in this game-based framework. And they suggest to use linkable ring signatures. So when senders deposit a coin in this coin mixer, they also name a public key. And when intended recipients want to withdraw a coin from the mixer, they can create a linkable ring signature which says that I know a secret key which corresponds to any one of these public keys uh, deposited in this contract, but I'm not telling you which uh, public key. And we need the ring signature to be linkable because such signature should be, uh, should be generated only once, and this gives us theft prevention. Uh, the downside of this protocol is that uh, the verification of a, li uh, of a ring signature linearly increases in the size of the anonymity set. So with current Ethereum block gas limits, it's like 10 million gas, uh, 33 or 35 um, is the size of the anonymity set, which is supported by Mobius. Um, and another cool idea was introduced by Barry Whitehead. It's called Miximus. And it seems that currently the community is going towards this um, scheme, um, but personally, I, I think it has several drawbacks. So first, uh, the idea is that senders can deposit equal amount of coins to the mixer, and that they also deposit a leaf in the Merkle tree, obviously in real world uh, implementations. Um, this Merkle tree is larger. It would have a depth of 16. So in theory, it is able to um, support anonymity sets 2 to the 16, so like 65,000 people, so it's super nice. And then withdrawers can create a statement, can prove in zero knowledge that they know the pre-image of a leaf, but they are not telling uh, the pre which leaf's pre-image they know. Uh, so this is how we can have uh, k-anonymity, and theft prevention is uh, achieved by applying nullifiers. The downside is that we would need to run a, a, a whole community-wide trusted setup, and we already know from the Zcash ceremony that running trusted setups is, is far from being trivial, so I would just avoid running trusted setups. And moreover, the deposit and the withdrawal gas costs of 
Miximus as are quite large, like also it, sh it was shown on Vitalik's slide that uh, verifying on-chain a ZK snark proof is like half a million gas cost. Um, so it's, it's, it's suboptimal, I would say. And there are many, um, many um, companies and uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful companies are, are working actively on this proposal and implementing it. So we have an implementation which is running on the browser. Um, there's even an iOS application where you could uh, mix your funds uh, with Miximus uh, if you trust those guys who run that uh, trusted setup. And there was later, uh, earlier this year, there was another work, uh, which was a joint work with Daniel Nagy, Chris Buckland, and Peter Burchi, which said that instead of using ring signatures and um, zero knowledge proofs, let's use verifiable shuffles. And so the idea is that uh, senders can, can create a list of public keys where they would like to withdraw, and, send, and recipients can shuffle this set of public keys. And instead of, have, instead of requiring a proof of correctness, because verifying a proof of correctness would be too costly, we ask the recipients to issue fraud proofs if the shuffle is not carried out correctly. Um, but this requires interactivity and also a security assumption that the recipients should remain online in order to monitor the blockchain whether the shuffle is is carried out correctly. And if it's not carried out correctly, recipients can issue a fraud proof and then the, the, shuffle, the malicious shuffler's deposit would be slashed. Um, but the downside, again, that we now have this always online assumption. Um, but more, more importantly, all these three previous proposals, um, Möbius, Miximus, and Mixith, are flawed in the sense that, so, they are a two-phase protocol, right? There's this little cute dog that posits a coin in the mixer. And now from a fresh address, we would like to withdraw the coin from the mixer. And in cryptocurrencies, exclusi generally, exclusively the, the sender can only pay for the occurring transaction fee. So now the recipient cannot withdraw the coin from the mixer because it's a fresh address by definition, so it doesn't have any funds. Um, so that's bad, then how can we get our coins back from the mixer? Um, well, you need to fund it on your own, right? But if you fund it on your own, then there's a trivial linkage between sender and recipient, and there, there would be no any privacy enhancement whatsoever. Um, you could say that let's use relayers, relayers are nodes who can fund this address on your behalf, but such an address, so Vitalik was just mentioning this relayers at the end of his talk. Such relayer networks are, we don't even have specification for that. It's not even deployed. So it's, it's just a theoretical construction. Um, no one knows how, how it will work out. So we don't really know how to solve it or we can wait for a protocol update where we allow the recipient of a transaction to pay for the occurring transaction fee, right? So. What were the design goals when, with Omer, we created this protocol? So first, we wanted to make it uh, available for everyone. So it should be able to support large anonymity sets. Uh, and it should be cheap in the sense that it should have low added overhead. So gas costs, added gas costs should remain low. Um, we, would, we wanted to tr avoid, obviously, trusted setups. We, we don't want to conduct and orchestrate a, a, glo a global trusted setup. And we don't want to rely on any um, yet to be deployed networks. So we don't want to rely on relayers or account abstraction or any other protocol. So we want to have privacy enhancing, which is deployable now. And our idea relies on threshold signatures. Um, just a quick recap. So in the threshold signature scheme, it's essentially a digital signature scheme. Um, in the digital signature scheme, we have three polynomial time uh, algorithms, uh, key generation, signing, and verification. And among these three, two happens off-chain, the key generation and the signing, and the verification of the signature scheme uh, happens on-chain. And luckily, 
in threshold signature schemes, we only modify the first two algorithms. So the verification remains essentially the same. We just modify the key generation and the signing algorithm in a way that participants can collaboratively create an, a valid signature. So we will have a single public key and the corresponding secret key is shared among, uh, in a distributed way, shared uh, between uh, the participants. And there, will, there is a threshold signing algorithm which allows participants to create a valid signature if and only if uh, more than a threshold uh, amount of people uh, gather together. But, so if you have a T out of N threshold signature scheme, then only T plus one, any T plus one set, subset of people can create a valid signature, but if there's less than T plus one participants, so any subset of T participants cannot create such a valid signature, and we have a regular verification algorithm, uh, so we have a regular um, ECDSA verification algorithm in case of cryptocurrencies, but I, I, I want to stress that essentially our protocol works with any kind of threshold signature scheme. So we, we, we do not rely on ECDSA specifically. Um, so our idea was to use threshold signatures. Um, and the benefit of using threshold signatures is that the on-chain cost is essentially just verifying a single ECDSA um, signature. So I think you cannot really have any better on-chain cost uh, than this. And we prove and define security in the universal composability framework. So it's super nice for you guys because if you want to take our uh, protocol and use in your protocol, then you can just uh, plug and play because this is already proven in a composable framework. All right. And also want to highlight that this uh, construction uh, not only works for account-based currencies, but for UTXO-based currencies. Uh, so we just want signature verifications and every cryptocurrency sub support a signature verification. So the idea here is that we have K participants on the uh, left hand side and these K participants deposit equal amount of coins to a public address which is generated by the distributed key generation algorithm. Um, and so we generate a distributed in a distributed fashion, a public key, uh, which is denoted here as the washing machine. And people can move coins from this address if and only if all of them collaborate. And they sign a transaction where they send the coins to corresponding fresh addresses. Um, and they sign this message in a, in a threshold, with a threshold signature scheme. And then any of any of these part senders, any of these participants can issue this payout, so-called payout transaction. Uh, so note that this, uh, how this work? So note that these case senders um, issue these deposit transactions and any of these can issue this uh, payout transaction. So all these K plus one transactions can be issued in one shot, can be generated in one shot. So that, that's crucial. And then the contract, uh, this, the washing machine, the smart contract, sends out the funds to these uh, fresh addresses. So now we don't have this guest payer linkability problem. And we argue that this just gives a better UX. So like there is no two-phase protocol, but instead um, it works just in one shot. Um, it has minimal gas costs because on-chain, note that just a single single ECDSA verification uh, occurred. Therefore, it's highly scalable. And we are going to update our paper soon, and we also show how to make our scheme robust in the sense that um, some parties can go offline in the threshold signing uh, uh, phase, and still the remaining parties will be able to mix the funds without adding any new security assumptions. Um, so let's imagine uh, an I ideal case, so where we will have a lot of, so where many transactions will be privacy enhanced. So if, if many transactions are privacy enhanced, then they will decrease the throughput of the blockchain since, um, since you will have added overhead, right? Uh, but we observe that the added overhead 
Sherlock has the least added overhead. So if all the transactions in the block will be, hopefully, uh, privacy enhanced, then we still have a meaningful uh, transaction per second, but with all the previous schemes, we have only uh, negligible uh, transaction per second. So all the, all the previous schemes have huge uh, overheads. You might ask, okay, but most of the computation is pushed off-chain deliberately. Uh, what is the cost of your protocol? Uh, what is the off-chain cost of your protocol? And um, there were some recent advancements at uh, Abishalat, uh, written by a paper ab by Abishalat and other researchers at Northeastern University, which shows that, uh, which is a highly scalable and highly, um, it's a really nice uh, threshold signature protocol which allows like 16 people uh, geographically distributed can sign a message under three seconds. So it's, it's, it's ridiculously, ridiculously fast and it's even faster than the current ZK snark prover. So if you want to prove the Miximus statement, the current best prover can do it in uh, four, under four seconds or something like that. And obviously for Mobius and Mixif, uh, this cost is kind of um, almost negligible. But I want to just highlight that Sherlock has an affordable off-chain uh, cost, like three seconds, right? Uh, just let me just quickly mention additional uh, related work. Um, it is a protocol called Aztec. It's a London-based um, team, and they provide confidential transactions. So in a confidential transaction, we see who are the transacting parties, but what we don't see is a transacted amount, it's hidden. Um, and, but it involves a trusted setup. They just running and started running their trusted setup. And it has mild gas costs. It's okay-ish. And if you would like to have anonymity and confidentiality at the same time, then you could use Zether, which is a paper written by Benedict Bunz, who is also around at AL and it, it gives fully private transactions. So it, it provides not only anonymity, but confidentiality. Um, but unfortunately, it has um, really high gas costs, like two million gas per transaction, which is not that nice. So it's absolutely, unfortunately, out of realm of scalability. Uh, right, so our vision for privacy is that users will be able to choose, just like for scalability, uh, also for privacy, we will have a plethora of, of privacy enhancing um, constructions and users will be able to choose which one they want to go with. So if the blockchain does not provide any built-in privacy guarantees, then users can choose, uh, like if they, if they want anonym, anonymity advancements, they can choose Sherlock. If they do not care about anonymity, they only care about confidentiality, they can choose Aztec. Uh, if they want both and they are quite wealthy, uh, then they can issue Zether transactions which require uh, two million gas. So it's like one quarter of an Ethereum a block, which is huge. So, so you need to pay a lot for fully private transactions, at least uh, I'm talking about right now Ethereum. And uh, here are some papers, um, references. Uh, the astute reader is referred to. Uh, these are nice papers. And um, our paper is on, on ePrint. And also, obviously, the code we developed is available and public online. So, yeah, feel free to have a look at it and use it. Uh, yeah. And with that, thank you. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.